Have you ever been to a live sporting event and caught yourself looking at the action on the Jumbotron more than the event itself? What well, a sort of by design. And in this episode, we travel to Dactronics in Brookings, South Dakota to see how they make the game look larger than life. I'm Leland, and welcome to Sports Dissected, the series. Hi right, guys, so we're here with uh, Justin Ochsner of Dactronics. How are you doing today? Good, how are you doing? I'm good. We finally made it to Brookings. What can we expect today at uh, Dectronics? You can expect to see some history of where the company has grown from 1968 all the way to today and how those big video displays that you see in sports stadiums are actually made. Okay, so obviously I, I, I'm a big, huge sports fan. I go to a lot of games. I see the big boards, but what I don't see are things like this anymore. So could you just explain? like some of the older technology you guys have created? Sure, so back in 1968, we were founded by two South Dakota State University professors, and they were big into wrestling, and they noticed when they went to wrestling events, there wasn't a real clear way to see what was going on, to keep up with the event. So they created what we call the mat side, and this is one of the first models that we ever made, three-sided scoreboards that would show the time and score and everything going around that event, and that was kind of our breakthrough into sports, so to speak. From there, what was the transition? So we started with some voting systems too. So we were working on different technology for voting systems. Even in the medical field, we were working on some medical supplies before we made the mat side and broke into sports. And from there, we started going into incandescent light bulbs, into glow cube technology of flipping dark color to light color displays, and eventually into LEDs, which brings us actually into video technology and video images. You mentioned a few terms that kind of went over my head. <laughs> So uh, are we gonna discuss that in a little more detail in the tour? Absolutely, okay. we can get into those details as much as you'd like. Uh, I'm looking at the, uh, the timeline over here as well. Can you just kind of walk me through this and some of the highlights in the industry? Sure, so highlights, getting started in 1968, as I said, then the biggest one of all, probably the Winter Olympics in 1980. So you think the miracle on ice, the scoreboard above that, made at Dactronics. Wow. And then from there, we went on to the stock exchange and went public in 1994. I have the Bucks display picture here because in 1998, that was our first professional football installation. It lasted for a full 18 years wow. before they needed to replace it. Other iconic installations, Times Square, Coca-Cola, in 2004, we made this interesting kind of wavy looking display to make uh, people stop and notice it. Big displays like Grand Lisboa here in 2006, we've covered buildings in LEDs so they can make light shows on the side of buildings using our technology as well. All right, so uh, Ms. Tanya, can you show us why we have this LED board immersed in water? Yeah, so this is our IPX7 tank. Okay. And the whole idea of this is to test ingress protection. That's what the IP stands for. And then seven is the type of test, which in this case is you have to submerge it at least so deep into water and then it has to survive. And this one's been in here, I don't know, about a month right now. And this is really a testament to how much we've improved our coatings and our ability to get our coatings to stick to all of our different parts. We wanted to improve the longevity of our product and make sure that it was safe for our customers. So this tests our product's ability to resist dynamic water pressure. You know, like when it's raining sideways, will the water get in? And again, we tend to do a lot of testing where we will age the product and then test it again and see is it still good. And that's one of the things we do to make sure that our product will meet our customers' life expectations. This is one of our temperature cycle chambers, and this is what we would define as thermal stress. This chamber goes from negative 40 to 105 C as an accelerated thermal stress test. If we say that the product's gonna last five years, we wanna test it for five years of life, but we can't wait five years for that to happen. So instead we accelerate the test and we expose our product to stresses beyond what they would see in the field. Like right now, it's at positive 105 degrees and things are still running. All right, Christopher, so I'm here. Got my special glasses on. <laughs> what are we gonna see today? So we're gonna watch a board being built from this bare board. We're gonna build that up to a populated board okay. with logic and LEDs. We're gonna put that into a, a plastic housing and then it's gonna become a full module with a, a louver on the face with a black gel coating on the backside to protect it as an outdoor module. How long does this process take? 
depending on the module, it's uh, to get say, one board through the line can take anywhere from 10 to 20 minutes. But there's a constant flow of boards running through the line. Depending on the speed we're running, we can place about uh, 4 million LEDs a day. So as these are fed up into the machine, you look kind of right down in here. There's a head on this side and a head on the other side of the machine. They're working with each other while one's picking up, the other one's placing. And when we did the Atlanta Falcons, their halo in the center of that, just that center display has 44,000 modules. So the LEDs come into a, in a box in a strip, getting fed onto a chain, and then into the machine to be placed into the board. This is a scoreboard digit. That big digit we saw back there will go into a housing and then get gel filled. So we're gonna again start out with a bare board. We're going to uh, apply a solder paste inside the machine with this machine as this board flows through the line. We use a stencil like this that matches up with pads on the board. So when that squeegee comes across there, you see that solder roll paste, drag it across the stencil, push it down through the apertures in the stencil and apply it to the pads on the board. So these are all our backside logic components that we're placing from tape and reel components, picking up 12 components at a time, working with the head on the other side of the machine while one is picking up, one is placing. Now we're doing an optical, automated optical inspection, verifying orientation, verifying that the part is the correct part placed. We're reading the vendor stampings on top of the part to make sure that it's the correct part. So here we go, a board will come in. It's actually gonna read a barcode that was placed by the, by the pick and place. Gonna check a little each area of the board, 3D image of each little area. And we'll get a good signal out, right at 100%. So this is a 1.9 millimeter pixel spacing indoor product. Oh, wow. Hey, I'm sorry, George. <laughs> so why is this important in the use of live sports or live sporting events? Just the ease of ability to replace that module easily. Okay, so we're in... We're in the metal shop. Here is where we start from raw aluminum. So we're making the structure. It has to be strong to, to hold it onto a wall, hold it up on the stadium, and it has to be uh, accurate and precise. One of the things about why we use aluminum, it's, it's a little more expensive than steel, but it doesn't rust, so it's gonna stay looking good. And uh, a lot of times, especially for indoor products, we are very tight on weight. This is what we call final assembly. This is where we go and we put everything inside the cabinet that it's gonna need to light up the modules. You see a lot of these carts around and these carts we've developed to hold exactly the right parts that we need to put into this cabinet. If they get done and there's extra parts sitting on this cart, they know that something's Something, missing, no. something's not <laughs> right, exactly. We need to check and see what we missed putting in. Oh, uh, what do mechanics say? Now they, they all come with extra screws. Yeah, exactly, <laughs> right. The, those are the spares, don't worry about those. All right, guys, so I'm here with uh, with Ryan. He's gonna show me how to assemble one of the boards, right? Yep, one of the NPN panels for that we put the modules in. So we're gonna start with the power supply here. We're gonna put on the AC and DC harnesses. So you can grab two of each there. Then you use the fork side terminal on the flat side down. Okay. Right. Yeah, there we go. There we go. Yeah. So then we'll take it over here and it goes into the panel. First step here is to put these brackets on that secure this power supply down. Okay. So those brackets are located right up here. We just need two of those and we're using these black screws here. Next step here is we got this AC harness. Then we put this hub board here, which is what the mods actually plug into. That's where they have that quick connect where they don't need harnesses on them. So they can do that technology to pull them off like that. Nice. Okay, I got it. Then the last step here, we got these spanning brackets they're called. So with this layout, we use six of them and they just go across here. These are what the mods magnet to. That's really all there is for the assembly work. There's a couple other things that we would do. We would take it down here and do a high pot test on it. There's a little receiver card that goes in here that holds all the firmware and stuff to control the mods and everything. Hi guys, I'm here with uh, Mr. Mr. Jay Parker, who's vice president of uh, Dactronic. Still in amazement, seeing our logos everywhere in the room. 
What is your role typically at Intel and what does your day to day look like? My day to day is is we're, we're out in front on the selling process, trying to secure orders, win orders. The world that I live in, the sports and entertainment world, it's about it's about trying to help provide solutions to our customers. But fans need to be entertained. They need to get something that, that they can't get, get at home so that they brings them out to the live event. And then our role is to compl complement the live event. People today expect replays in a sporting facility. So that's becoming more and more common. Even down to the high school markets, they're wanting replays. And so our products bring all of that and, and whether it's the, the biggest uh, major league sport facility or down to a high school, our products can help entertain the fans, create a better activity and a better experience for all involved. Where do you guys come in if a team's building a new stadium? Do you guys try to jump in at the forefront in the beginning or is that you guys are at the end? Generally, it's early on. You know, the strengths of Daxtronics is, is we're an engineering company and manufacturing company. So if we can get in early, we can help them design steel structures that are appropriate. You know, not too much steel, not too little steel, but the right amount getting the right power locations, which can save the owners money if we can get in early enough to help them with those types of decisions. What's been some of your, your favorite projects you've worked on? Favorite projects? You know, I've been over here for over 25 years and, and there's a long list of them. Tampa Bay Buccaneers in 1998. Um, that was one of the first. On the indoor side in about 2000, we did the Minnesota Wild Arena. Those stand out to me is because those were key projects for us to get into this space and really show something that nobody else could do with the, with the displays working together and the and how our control systems can tie them all together like you're seeing in this room. Um, so those were 25 years ago. Those were really, really exciting. We're doing projects now that, that are high resolution. Um, we're doing great, great things in Times Square. We're doing great things out in Las Vegas. So I like them all. I like, as long as it's our product, I like them all. All right, guys, so I'm here with uh, Mr. Reese Curtinbach. How are you doing today? Doing great. President of Dextronics, right? Yes. When you first started with Dextronics, did you jump right into the president role or did you kind of work your way up from, from different positions? Yeah, I've uh, got a long history with Dextronics. Uh, I started as a student when I was uh, at South Dakota State University. I was an electrical engineering student there. Came back in 91 as a full-time employee. Applications engineer, project manager, um, engineering manager, uh, business unit vice president. Those are some of the titles I had. Uh, I worked a lot with the technology. I worked a lot with customers. I worked a lot with suppliers. I worked uh, across many uh, different areas of Dectronics. So by the time I stepped uh, into the role of CEO, I had a, quite a good feel of what many areas of the company were like. I've got a deep history because okay. my father was one of the co-founders of Dectronics. Uh, he was a professor of engineering at South Dakota State, and uh, one of his colleagues and him wanted to, to do more, and so they founded Dectronics. How important is it for you guys to continually push the needle as far as technology and being on the forefront? We're in a technology business, so if you're not continually changing, adapting, adjusting, you fall behind. And so a big part of what we do is to stay in front technically and it's not just the products themselves, it's uh, the approaches, how our people are working, it's the software that drives these screens, it's, uh, it's everything that uh, needs to come together to have a successful experience for our customer. Even when I started, our main technology was light bulbs. Uh -huh. So it was light bulbs and, and you could see them. I mean, they were like three inches apart. And today, you know, some of the screens you have here, um, two millimeters, 1.2 millimeters apart. The whole technology landscape has changed in the, in the last 20 some years. Mr. Jody, Jody Chris. Correct. Solutions Manager at Dectronics. What does Solutions Manager mean? That's an interesting question. Um, it's a title that we've given to kind of few of us here at Dectronics that oversee our engineering teams. We're working with our customers, trying to understand what's out in the market for new ideas and things like that that we would feed into our research and development teams. So we kind of try to prioritize those ideas and figure out which ones are most interesting to work on. So kind of a two-pronged approach from the engineering perspective, really. You've got the engineering of the, the product itself, and then you got the engineering of the implementation out in the field. You're dealing with architects. Yep. They have big, beautiful dreams and ideas. Yep. How do you kind of tame those and make them like come to life and make them actual 
like feasible. Yeah, you know, that's uh, a lot of my day to day right now is taking some of those things They get escalated like, hey, somebody's wanting to try to do this. And it's like, well, that's interesting. As an engineer, it's like there's physics involved in some of the stuff too. That so you kind of got to toe the line of what's possible, what's, you know, not possible, but it does push us to innovate and to, to get more creative and try to accomplish those things. I would say the nice thing with the architects is they, they dream big and they throw out all kinds of cool ideas and then we can try to take that and say okay here's what we can do right here's here's what's possible and here's what we can do to try to accomplish that and there's usually something in the middle that turns out to be pretty fantastic. Let's say we have some students uh, that are watching that that are um, are engineering or, or wanting to get into engineering what what's some of the things that they should be kind of looking for looking towards or studying or really focusing on? Yeah that's a really good question um we we have all kinds of engineers um you know from the display technology side you know we've got software engineers, hardware engineers, electrical engineers, mechanical engineers. We have every kind of engineer. And then on the installation side, we've got structural engineers, uh, power systems engineers. So, I mean, any type of engineering field, we can probably find a spot for you at Doctronics. All right, guys, so I'm here with uh, Mr. Chris DeRicier of the Texas Rangers. What does your job kind of entail? Uh, Senior Director of Ballpark Entertainment, which just basically means I've been put in charge of over all the production here. I have my boss, uh, Chuck Morgan, who's our Executive Vice President. He's entrusted me and our group uh, with being the lead production uh, group here. But basically anything that has to do with production inside these facilities, we're the ones um, that are doing that, whether it's on a game day, you know, for the Rangers or, or any other kind of event. Every event that happens here, uh, you guys kind of transform the, the arena or stadium. Um, but the scoreboard itself stays the same. Do you guys utilize it differently for four different events? We absolutely do. And that's the great part of uh, going with Dactronics that we did. They have a great scoring system back end that helps us switch quickly from, you know, football to college baseball to the different sports that we have out there. Um, but thankfully for uh, their flexibility on the back end of things to handle a rodeo or to handle a football game or a baseball game. I mean, obviously we talked about the screens, but I want to get into kind of like what we're looking at behind us here and how it you know, translate on the, on the actual board. When you get into a room like this, a scoreboard control room, it can be a little daunting because you're like, oh my goodness, look at all these different so parts. That. But when you break down the room, you've got your, all of the sources come to here. And then I've got my guy, Ugo Carbajal, who punches and he's the technical director. And so he's punching the buttons. This is another Dactronics product, the Live Clips product. And so any video that we run, you know, in park or animation, it comes from this machine. So you've got this, you've got the two folks there you know, who do replays so we can get as many looks, you know, to try to give the fans a, a better experience that maybe they'll get at home, you know, that, and that's the biggest thing, right? Is you're trying to get the, you know, the fan off the sofa to come in and enjoy the sounds and the sights and the smells and all those things, you know, and so that's where we gotta be on our game to make sure we're providing the highest production possible. Then this row up here, you've got different folks who run the, the different graphics that you see, like the, we call them lower thirds or, you know, different little boxes that'll fly in. But once you start breaking the room down and realizing they're just, you know, everybody's got their their job and you know, it kind of feels like the Enterprise from Star Trek, but it's a, uh, you know, <laughs> it's a big team effort. All right, guys, so I'm here with uh, Mr. Chuck Morgan. How are you? I'm doing great, doing good. They tell me you're one of the most interesting men in sports. What's your title and how long have you been with the Rangers? Well, my title, it's a long title, okay. Executive VP of Ballpark Entertainment Productions and Promotions. Ooh. In addition, I'm also the public address announcer, have been for a long time uh, with the Rangers, and and I've been with the Rangers since uh, 1983. So been here for, for your tenure, how have you seen technology change specifically with the board that, you know, the Dectronics created for you guys? It changed the way folks watch ball games in the ballpark. The quality of the product, especially the Dactronics product. Early days, you know, the picture wasn't quite as clear as it is now, but but now it's as good as watching uh, TV at home. But the things that we can do with replays, the things that we can do with uh, video production, absolutely incredible. I mean, it's almost as good as having a network television control room in a ballpark that's used to work with the scoreboard. So it's, it's just incredible. When it comes to locker rooms, it's only two types of people. There's everyone else, and then there's Shield Lockers. Since 2014, Shield's number one priority has been to disrupt all industry standards. 
by blurring the line between traditional function and modern masterpiece. With their use of non-traditional materials such as solid surface, they're able to set their clients' imagination free. The Brooklyn Nets and Kansas Jayhawks trusted them, and you should too. Visit shieldlockers.com to unlock your dreams. But beware, because this isn't your father's locker room.